Welcome back to the One Chart at a Time video series. I'm your host, John Schwabish. So far in this series, we've looked at two categories of data visualizations. The first category are those graphs and charts that are used to compare different categories. And the second group are those visualizations that are used to show changes over time. Now we're gonna move into visualizations that are used to show distributions in your data. And one of the classic ways that you can do that is to create what's called a histogram. Now at its core, a histogram is really just a bar chart, but I think many readers may get confounded or confused because in a histogram, we might be marking things like the median or percentiles or the mean, or talk about the variance or the standard deviation. And of course, it's important to know that not everybody knows these terms. So to kick off this new section of visualizations, I'm really happy to have my good friend Jim Vallandigham come on to talk about the histogram. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jim so you can learn more about this important graph type. Hi, I'm Jim Vallandigham. I'm super excited to be here to talk to you about the intricate and exquisite histogram. Histograms are great because they allow you to quickly see a distribution or shape of a data set. They look similar to bar charts, but while bar charts are used to display information around categorical data, histograms can be used to show continuous data. So real quick, we can dive into continuous data, which is also known as quantitative data. And it's data measured in numbers rather than labels or categories as in categorical data. Continuous data examples include stuff like ages in a group of pop people, or as we'll see in a minute, the number of calories in the meals of a fast food restaurant. So how do we build a histogram to visualize this continuous data? Well, Nathan Yao from Flowing Data has a great primer on this that I recommend you checking out. But first you take your data and you sort the values from lowest to highest. Between this min and max, you create a set of equally sized value ranges or bins that will be used to aggregate the data. Now, you put each data point into its corresponding bin based on its value, and you stack the data points on top of one another when they're in the same bin. And finally, you abstract away the nebulous data points uh, by replacing these stacks with bars, with each height, uh, the height of each bar being proportional to the number of data points in the stack that it replaces. So you have a set of ranges or bins. Each bin has a, a bar in it, and the bar's height is proportional to the number of data points in that, uh, in that bin. There are a lot of amazing examples of histograms out there in the wild. One of my favorites is the histogram uh, used in a 2015 article by the Upshot, uh, New York Times Upshot, explaining the number of calories that we are consuming when we go to Chipotle, which, if you don't know, is a fast food burrito restaurant. Um, this histogram shows up, it shows up up front and center in the article, and like so many graphics, uh, the annotations really make it shine. We see the distribution of all the orders you can place at Chipotle, and it looks like a pretty normal bell shape or distribution. And then you start to read the captions and the annotations and realize that more than a half of the offerings uh, that Chipotle provides are more than a thousand calories, with a good chunk of them being over 2,000 calories, the suggested daily limit for most people. My favorite annotation in this, this chart is uh, a bump in the chart around the 1600 calorie mark that indicates that the spike is due to an orders of add-ons of guacamole and chips. This piece is a wonderful example of the power of histograms in elucidating data while also being a great way to tell a data-driven story. There's one more example I wanted to mention, an online tool called uh, Pianogram that shows the relative number of times a particular piano key gets pressed uh, in different songs. And the visual is the keys of a keyboard um, that are used as the bins as the histogram, with each, the height being the, the number of, of times that that note is pressed. It's, it's really amazing. You can even load in your own song. It's pretty cool. Now, while histograms are great, um, like many visualization methods, there are complications. Just generally, the visual similarity between histograms and bar charts can make 
them confusing to read, especially for beginners or people unfamiliar with this particular chart type, um, especially if they've been staring at bar charts all day. Um, but there's also more complex uh, issues that you have to deal with when building a histogram. And most of these issues or decisions that you have to make are based around the bins. Amelia McNamara has an amazing interactive exploration of these choices, which I'll use for illustration. Uh, central quandary with the chart type is how many bins you should use and thus how big or how wide each bin should be. While there are some formulas for picking good and starting points, the decision is up to you as the visualization creator. If your bins are too wide, all your points get chunked into just two or three bars and you lose any re resolution. If your bins are too narrow, the histograms start to get noisy and spikes or patterns you think you might see might just be artifacts of those narrow bins. Another potential, potential issue is around where the bins start and thus where the cutoffs are for each bin. You can imagine shifting the bins forward and backwards and these cutoffs between the bins determine which data points are dropped into which bins. As you shift, uh, different, different patterns might emerge or jump out based on these cutoff changes. So just when using histograms, it's important to experiment a bit. Try out different bin widths and different bin offsets to ensure that the shapes and the patterns you see aren't just artifacts of the visualization method itself. I hope you enjoyed this quick jaunt around the histogram chart type, and I can't wait to see your histograms and other data visualizations. Thanks. And thanks to Jim for that great review of histograms. Hopefully you now know, if you didn't already, a little bit more about them, how they work, how to read them. And again, be careful when you are creating graphs that fall into this particular category of visualizations where we're showing distributions because not all of your readers are going to equally understand all aspects of measures of dispersion, like means and medians and variance and standard devi deviations. And not all people are going to be familiar with these different graph types. So come back tomorrow. We've got more graphs to talk about in this particular section. Thanks so much for tuning in.